wow, that was appropriate too. Um, every day. Every day. Well, and that wasn't made for a carol hymn, you know. It was a uh, hymn of his kingdom, which is right along the line <laughs> what we're going to be talking about again today. So praise God. Um, yes, you know, uh, his kingdom. His kingdom, because he's the king. And as you know, over the course of the year, I had been doing a series on For King and Kingdom. And so this is part four. Changed up a little bit from what it was intended to be. So Father, I thank you. I thank you, Oak. Holy Spirit, you are so welcome here. I thank you. I thank you that when we come together, there's a sweet aroma that comes up to your nostrils, Father, and you breathe it in and you rejoice in it. Thank you for being with us, for being present with us, for empowering us. Father, I, I thank you that for every person here uh, listening, for those that are gone, I thank you for your body of believers, your community of faith, and I thank you for what is coming. And that's your kingdom on earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. So it was about two years ago one day. I don't know how it happened. I can't tell you if there was, if I'd been pondering a verse or just what happened. All I know is one day I woke up with great anguish and sorrow and a weeping in my spirit and my soul. So much anguish it hurt. And what it was was about the great falling away. And it went on for months, days. I would cry. And, and it, it was just, an, I can't describe to you the anguish. And then in September, I preached about it at Agape. I don't think I ever preached here. I don't know what happened. Did I preach about the great falling away? Well, I did at Agape. And um, that was September last year and out of that came this series of the kingdom because I don't think we understand what the kingdom is about fully <laughs> and I think that it's part of what leads to the great falling away so it's my burden to do as much as I can and if there's any part that's not clear, please let me know, okay? So today we're going to start with Matthew 24. And I know you're going to wonder what this has to do with the kingdom, but it is about the falling away. So Matthew 24. Of course, the background is here is Jesus has just kind of done the what's titled the woe to the scribes and Pharisees. And then he begins to talk about what's coming in the great tribulation. And he, in the first eight verses, you have the beginning of sorrows. And we're going to pick it up in verse 9. 
then, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations. Not some nations. All nations. Everyone. All nations. That doesn't exempt the U.S. or Israel. All nations. For my name's sake. And the many will be offended. Now this is in the New King James. And maybe your verse, it, your um, Bible has a different translation for offended, and we'll talk about that. But many will be f offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. The many, okay, I got to stop there, even, even though I, I was planned on reading all. Doesn't that break your heart? This is talking about believers. Many will betray one another, hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So, obviously, this is the tribulation, verse 9. And we're hated by all nations. Verse 10 says, offended. Has anyone looked at their Bible to see what that? Yes, Lynette. Fall away. Yes. Anybody else have something? Fall away. That's why I call this the great falling away. Because that word offended means fall away. It also means to fall into a trap. Stumble. Okay. Betray. Yeah. Well, I want to stop there and talk about offended. Or fall into a trap. You become offended... Okay, listen. <laughs> this is like critical because we all get offended at something sometime by someone. Offense is a trap. Amen. It's a trap. Now, offense is out there. But we do not have to take offense have you ever heard that? Yes. I take offense at that. Well, you don't have to. You do not have to take it. It is a choice. Offense is out there all the time, whether it's deliberately or unconsciously, we get offended. But you don't have to take it. And see, this is primary because it is this offense that leads this downward spiral to everything else. You know, I was thinking of this common thing. Let's say we women, we understand best friends, okay? So we have a best friend, and the best friend said something to us. And we've had this best friend relationship for a long time. But this best friend said something, and for some reason, we took offense. Do you know what happens when you take offense? You start thinking differently. And you, yes, and you start thinking differently about that person. And if that offense isn't cleared, if you take that offense and let that germinate inside you, you start thinking differently of this person, and it goes over and over and over in your mind what they said and how they hurt you and how unjust it is. And eventually, you'll talk to somebody else about that friend your now view of that friend, and you have betrayed what was your best friend. Yeah, it's a faulty program, what you're taking, programming. 
and it grows into a hate and a bitterness. So even when a non-believer says something to us, we can take offense, and then we begin to judge that person or whatever. Offense is critical here to learn not to take offense. Now, this is a little trick. It took me all these years to figure out till about a couple years ago. Can you believe that? Yeah. 60 years or whatever to figure that out. I just say to myself, I refuse to take offense. I refuse. I may have to say that several times throughout the thing till I'm no longer thinking about it. But I refuse to take offense. And what happens then is when you, take, when you do that, then you can go back to your friend and say, you know, you said something, and I, I would just like you to clarify it. And there isn't this angst inside of you. There isn't this thing so that you're free to discuss and figure out and work out without problems. This, this seems to be talking to us believers. So whether the world gets this or not, I believe we believers must get this. We must learn how to not take offense so we can love one another, that we don't fall into betrayal, we don't fall into beginning to hate one another. Because, I mean, this is, to me, one of the saddest verses. When Jesus says they'll know us by our love, when he tells us to love one another, this verse says that these believers, church in this end times, will begin to get offended, to fall away, to betray, and to hate one another. The word betray means to deliver over with close involvement. It's an enemy can't betray you. Only a friend can betray you. Yeah. Only you can betray a friend. Betrayal is a close involvement. And I think we know what hate is. <laughs> then many false prophet, prophets will rise up or appear before public. What I thought about this verse is, you see, it is in this soil bed, soil bed of offense and hate, betrayal, that then allows these false prophets to come up. Can you believe that? We... Well, we would provide the soil bed for this to happen? Oh, guard our hearts, Lord. And, they'll, and deception. So out of this will come the false prophets and deception. And because lawlessness, lawlessness, what will... It, does somebody else have that word in their Bible? Does it another translation rather than lawlessness? You have lawlessness? Okay. Lawlessness means the contempt, contempt and violation of law. A contempt for the, for the law, wickedness. So, because this contempt of law or the good laws of God, the righteousness, because of lawlessness, wickedness will abound. All these things are hooked together. They lead deeper and deeper into this tribulation time. And the love of many will grow cold. Bible Hub said this grow cold is spiritual energy blighted or chilled by a malign or poisonous wind. 
the spiritual energy of the church, the body, blighted by a poisonous wind. So, I have a question. <laughs> who, in this Bible, who will be saved? In this verses, who does it say will be saved? Those who endure. Overcomers. Those who will endure. That word endure means remains under the load and bears up. Those who endure. Well, I want to be one of those who's in, who will endure. You too. Yeah. Keep on being faithful. That's good. Keep on. We have to keep on. Persevere. So do you wonder, I wonder this, and I'm not making a comment, I'm just wondering, are the ones who became offended and betrayed and hated one another and grew cold, are they saved? You know, this year we have heard of some very well-known pastors, ministers, evangelists disavowing their faith in Jesus. I have read some things that just made me sob. Ones that have written books like Desiring God. Worship leaders, main worship leaders like Hillsong that then decide and come public and say they are no longer Christian. I mean, doesn't that wrench your heart? Yes. I mean, I can see somebody having a struggle time and taking like a little time to get spiritually renewed, but to say you're no longer a Christian? Yeah, yeah, I, it, it is so concerning. And then things that we normally wouldn't have thought of happening these days, you know, among an in body of believers. And, and uh, I, I am not in any way judging. I, I want you to know that. It's just my heart wrenching. I mean, even that there's so many... I. I'm telling you, we're doing some premarital counseling. Um, we've got two couples right now. We're premarital counseling, and what is amazing to me that they are Christians, and but they've been living together without a second thought of what the Word has to say about that. And and again, I am not judging. I'm just saying this is the way it is. It's like we're dull to the spiritual things of God and um, like we don't even think about it. So again, <laughs> I'm sorry that this is somewhat heavy right now, but I don't know any other way to present this. We here are accountable to one and another, right? Right? And I hope that if we see something that we will lovingly and graciously and with a heartfelt concern bear each other and, and help work through a thing rather than allow any of this to take root. And I pray that for the whole body of Christ. So there are many cited reasons for this falling away if you read up on it. But I believe that there may be some underlying reasons that maybe aren't always recognized. And the one I'm going to start to address is, I think very well sometimes we have a presentation of a very 
weak, partial, or misrepresented gospel. So I'm going to ask you guys, you give me feedback here. How is the gospel often presented? If you were going to try and lead somebody to Jesus, how, how would you kind of present it? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, I'll sum it up for you because I don't know that they heard over here. I should have a microphone by you guys, right? Um, but uh, so Beatrice was saying that she thinks that sometimes the if I sum this up, sometimes the presentation of the gospel is not as timely as for today or as fresh as for today in addressing the audience of today. Is that what you're kind of saying? Kind of lack that? That's a good point. Yes. Yes. Good. Yes, your testimony is a good preach, isn't it? It's a good, yes. Yes, that's the more effective way, or mo not more effective, but an effective way because what does our banner say? <laughs> Unto death, yes, that's right. So our testimony is very valid. Very valid. Elena. That's right. That's right. That's good. Amen. That's good. No. So if you didn't hear, Eleanor was saying how you live, you live the good news, right? Is basically and talk that way. Those were all really, really very good points. I came to the yes. Art loves that one. <laughs> yes. Very good. I agree. That's right, the Romans Road, yeah. 
Thank you. Yes, those are all very good answers, how we live the gospel, how we um, help each other reach it. But when it comes down to actually leading somebody through that door, um, how's it often presented? For instance, I came, my neighbor led me by the four spiritual laws. Anybody else get that? Yeah, the four spiritual laws. Anybody, you guys know what that is? Oh, okay, we'll have to go over that sometime. Very simple. And you ask Jesus into your heart, right? And he comes to live within you. And it's very effective. Um, but I think it, it, it and some of the other presentations may lack something that we need to do. Um, it's often presented, ask Jesus in your heart, you go to heaven. Correct? Or you'll have a better life. Right? Help you with your problems. I think Josh, uh, free you and help you with your addictions. And all those are true. They're all true. But I want to know, what is the gospel? What does gospel mean? Good news. Yes. What does Jesus say about the gospel? Let's start there. It's good news. What? Eternal. I, I, I may not be leading this right. You see, we stop at the gospel. But the full term is the gospel of the kingdom. It's not just good news. It's not only good news, you'll be saved from these things, but you're put into a kingdom, and that's when we fall short of that. Now, you can look up. The gospel of the kingdom is a, mentioned 162 times in the New Testament alone. <clears throat> and only a couple of times is it shortened to gospel. When it, it is short in the gospel, it is meaning the whole term. The gospel of the kingdom. And in a kingdom, there's a king. But what happens is, is I don't believe we're, we're taught enough or explained enough of this so that Matthew 24, 14, the last verse of that section we were reading, so all these things we read earlier, right? And we ended with, but he in, who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations. And then the end will come. So we fall, I think we fall short if we just say the gospel receiving Jesus, that is imperative. It is the important thing to do. But there's more. There's the kingdom and what that means. And why do I think it's the more important? Because it was the very beginning. First words Jesus said, the very beginning of his ministry and all through what he talks about is a about the kingdom, how to enter the kingdom, how to live in the kingdom, how to look for the kingdom, how to pray for the kingdom. It's about the kingdom of God. Jesus' first public, wo public words in Matthew 4, 17 were from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He began, and to say, he continued to preach that throughout all the scripture, everything he said. 
Luke 4, 43, I must preach the kingdom of God. Jesus says, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been called. Again, it's a big topic. It's mentioned 162 times. The whole gospel is how we live in the kingdom and what it looks like. It's the good news of the kingdom of God. It's the good news of the kingdom of God. Another um, reason or could be reason for the falling away, of course, we talked about the offense or the calling away, uh, falling away. I think some people um, fall away because they're not understanding the kingdom and then hard times come. And we've all had those. Or they have hatred coming at them. Or thinking that God may be withholding something from them. Or disappointment. I thought it would be more like this. Blah, blah, blah. We talked about a weak understanding of the gospel, discipleship, and personal growth. I think sometimes... um, People come to the Lord. They don't get into a body of believers. They're not discipled. They're not encouraged in their personal growth, and they fall away. I also think there's theological fuzziness of the gospel, uh, which, which will develop into objection of the faith. And one of those is like judgment, what judgment is. I'd love to go into that, but I'm going a little long here. Well, let's just say, have you heard any, anybody say, I don't believe God, a good guy would send somebody to hell? Yes. Isn't that like a common one? And do you know what you would say to that person? That's right. That's right. I didn't write this down, but it, um, uh, the verse is, uh, well, in John 3. Did we read those verses? No, we didn't. Okay. I'm going to turn to it. We're looking at John 3. And I'm not sure what the verse is. Um, first, I'm going to read John 3, 3. Jesus answered and said to him, he's talking to um, Nicodemus, most assuredly, that's a strong beginning in case you don't know it, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So, you know, there's no understanding of the kingdom of God until we're born again and we begin to see. And then in verse 5, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit of God, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So we must be born again to enter. But what was the one I was going to read? Oh, I know. Okay. So then these are the more familiar. For God so loved the world... See, God doesn't hate the world. He loves the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, But he who does not believe is, who said this, condemned all 
ready because he has not believed in the name. See, we're already condemned. We're already all going to hell, so to speak, until we're born again. God isn't doing the judging. He's not saying, he's not judging that this one goes to hell and this one doesn't. We're already dead. I, I don't have this in my notes today, but I have it in my heart. So until Jesus came, we are separated from God, right? We all know this, right? We fell, the world fell, man fell when he knelt before Satan. He lost his crown, his robe, Adam did. He turned over. He had been given dominion to subdue. Dominion, that's a kingly word. He had been given dominion to subdue and to fulfill and to replenish the earth. But he gave it away. His crown was removed. His, his robe was taken off. He laid his scepter down. I've talked about this in the other previous ones about the kingdom. And so earth, the world, falls just like Satan. We're now separated from the kingdom of heaven. And we're lost in this lost state. We're dead. The earth dies. Man dies. We're dead in our sins. We're walking dead. Do you ever think about the fascination of zombies? Boy, I am really off script here. Zombies are walking dead, right? That's what we are. We're walking dead. We may be walk breathing and moving but we're dead we're this walking dead until jesus until we receive him and we his spirit comes in us and we are born again now we're alive so if god doesn't judge if you never receive jesus you just go in your same state of death Death cannot live with life. Have you ever put a dead thing, kept a dead thing around you? Stink and rot. And you know what it does? It, it spreads its poison to you. That's why we don't touch the dead. There's things that happen. Dead cannot live alongside life. The kingdom of heaven, God, heaven is for those that are alive. Death can't be there. It's not God, this terrible God punishing. It's the way it is. See, judgment is separation. Who remembers the pen example that Art gave? Anybody? Okay, you have a bunch of pens, and you lay them down, and you say, okay, separate the blue pens from the black ink pens. That's just what judgment is. It's just separation. It's just separation. There isn't a... <laughs> thank you for the example. There isn't a, a, an angst in that. You're just separating. God separate, keeps separate the life from the death. Oh, wow, am I off script? Yes. That's right. That's a very good verse, because that is his desire. Well, I'm sorry I got on that. Um, <laughs> so, there are, it, it, I think, 
and I really have been talking to myself about this, to think through what some objections might be to receiving the gospel and having a very good, I don't want to say defense for it, but a very good way, uh, understanding to present to somebody else. Um, let me catch my breath and get back on target. <laughs> So, I'm wondering if there is some, if sometimes we present an anemic gospel. Yes, Beatrice. Oh, yes. Oh. Yes, amen. Yes. Yes, that's where our mind goes, right? But I thought, I think you showed your heart that, thank you for sharing that, by the way, and I hope everybody could hear that, but I just thank you for sharing your heart, though, that you saw, you responded, and you see the need for her to know. And sometimes when people respond like that to us, it may be for us to see, this is the one we really need to be praying for and believing God for. So, well, praise God for that. I, so again, I, I um, think that sometimes when we present the gospel and we don't understand that it is about the kingdom, and pre that um, we may allow for a shallow, selfish response to the invitation to come to Christ. And I, you know, I, I said, I, I came by the four spiritual laws and um, I became born again. Um, and I certainly have grown. But I think what happens beyond that point, I was discipled. Women, older women, they took me. I was 20 or 21. They took me and they brought me to church and they brought me to uh, women aglow, and I got, I went to a prayer meeting and got baptized by the Holy Spirit, and I had no idea what that was or what the heck was happening to me, you know, um, because I hadn't heard any of this. I'd never heard anybody clap in church before I was raised in a, so, so I really thank God for that discipleship, because that reinforced, got me plugged in, um, 
uh, beyond just accepting Christ and then going about my life the same way. See, it's a change of life. We've switched kingdoms, and we need to really encourage each other uh, and to lead somebody to bring them to that understanding. Now, I will say that God set me up before I came to the four spiritual laws, though. He really did set me up because um, even though I wasn't a, a Christian as we know it, um, I did read my Bible all often and grew up within a traditional type church and really had a heart for the word of God. And uh, he spoke to me one night while I was taking a bath. And he said, and I could hear his spirit speak to me. I, I've always kind of heard God. And um, he said, and it was, I can't remember the verses now. You guys will probably remember. But the question was, I was thinking of this verse, will you leave all for me? And it was leave husband or mother and father and brother and sister. And I, and I go, well, God, I don't know. I got to have two weeks to think about that. <laughs> and before the two weeks was up, long before the two weeks up, I just ran. I knelt at my bed and I said, I don't know how. I don't know what it means. But all I know is I got to have you. I got to have peace. And I heard him say, I actually had a vision of Jesus that I knelt for. And then I heard him say, he was like, come to me. And then I heard him say, ask Pat, who was my neighbor. So the next morning, because this was like midnight, as soon as I could, I ran over, knocked on Pat's door. And I said, Pat, when you say you're a Christian and I say I'm a Christian, I think there's a difference. She looked at me with big eyes because she thought I was a Christian all this time. And she goes, come on in. I got something to share with you. <laughs> and led me through the four spiritual laws. But she also got me plugged in. She did something that I have continued doing from this day, and maybe I've shared this before. After I prayed to receive Jesus, she says, come on. She put me in her car. She drove me to three different places of her friends, strangers to me. Called them out to the car and said to me, tell them what you just did. And I had to tell them, these strangers. I do that now. I tell everybody, for what you believe in the heart, but with the mouth, right? You confess the Lord, then you shall be saved. That puts it, you've crossed over the line. You've made that step. You know, it's hard to, to fall back after that. So, oh my goodness. That's right. <laughs> so I, I do that to people now too. And I really do believe that's important. But the good news, it's all about God's kingdom. This is the gospel, the good news, the kingdom of God. So I think the third reason that there's sometimes a falling away is that we don't understand about the kingdom. I believe that that hinders us. And it, 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 it hinders us from going all in. Going all in. It hinders us from being sold out. It hinders us from forsaking all. See, we're to endure like Jesus. Endure our cross. We're to endure for the glory set before us. So my encouragement is for us to begin to really think and explore and let the Holy Spirit Re, just reveal his kingdom. Let all those words pop out at you now. It's all about the kingdom from beginning to end because that's where the ending is. When the Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords and the kingdom of, he sets up the kingdom on the earth 
And then he turns over the kingdom to God, the kingdom of heaven, so that they're joined once more again. Read Revelations. <laughs> Read that part with the understanding that it's about the kingdom. It makes a lot of things clearer for you instead of getting caught up in all the other stuff. We must understand that, there, that you see, a king is the ruler of all. And the sphere he rules is the kingdom. Now, if he's our king, then we have to give him, we have to live in the kingdom. We give him the sphere of all we are, right? Right, amen. We must understand that the kingdom of God is diametrically opposed to, the, to this world. It's opposed, it's diametrically opposed to any government and world systems. It's completely opposite. Jesus spent his life, his whole, this whole three years of his life, explaining, demonstrating, teaching, and living completely opposite of the world. Just count how many times in the Sermon of the Mount did Jesus say, you say, but I say. And it's always completely opposite. You say, uh, I forget all of them, but anyway. Oh, it's always opposite. Very good. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We are. Yeah, we are. Because remember in Acts when they talked about Paul and who was with them? Barnabas, and they said, these men have turned the world upside down. No, they just turned it right side up. <laughs> the world is upside down. <laughs> you had a... That's right. Yes. Yes, 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 very good. Thank you very much. That's been very um, helpful, too. So the disciples taught, wrote, and lived opposite of our world. We read, um, we read how the early Christians, the very first Christians, lived their faith in a much different form than the world of that time. They came together. They made some things common. They met together, and, and I don't think it was, we tend to think of it as all communal. I don't think that was the case. I think you could live together. You could sell all that you had, but it wasn't required. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the situation with um, Ananias and Sapphira. Is that, did I say that right? But they lived differently than the world around them. The letters of the apostles, all the letters that were written uh, were encouraging and teaching and discipling the believers on how and why to live in what they called then the way. They were known as the way. So kingdom living, I, I want to give an idea, uh, try to get this into our understanding. It would be as if we, we as Americans, okay, say we're living in Iran. So you're living in Iran. You have to obey all the laws of Iran, right? If you don't obey them, you know, you're punished severely. You obey those laws. 
But if you're set free and you go to live in the United States where we have more freedoms, you're living differently, okay? So when you're living in a country, you're subject to those, those countries' laws, correct? Okay. We have been born again. We are not subject to these laws any longer. We've been born again. We're not subject to the restricting laws anymore. We now live in this other country of great freedom. Freedom to love. We have been delivered from the power of Satan, of darkness, and conveyed or transfer, transferred into the kingdom of the son of his love. Colossians 1, 13. We've been, I'm going to read that again. We have been born, he has delivered us. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed or transferred us into the kingdom of the son of his love. In victory. It is about the kingdom of God. We are, enter, we are to enter the kingdom, this kingdom, that is diametrically opposed to the world. It's opposite. And we're to live that way, in that freedom, but with the new kingdom's responsibilities. Just as Beatrice was saying and, and uh, Grace were saying, the opposite. Grace was saying it says to love, you know, the world tells you to love yourself. Jesus says, you know, love the other, put the other first. Beatrice said, you know, we have this. Well, anyway, you heard it. But we, um, we become, oh, I skipped a note here. So we're going to live in this new world, th this new kingdom that is diametrically opposed to the world we knew and we grew up in. And we become citizens of a different kind of kingdom. It's the eternal kingdom. We are no longer under the standards of the old, but now we avow ourselves to this entirely new way of living and being. Our life has changed. It's transformed. We are a new creature. We're a new creature. Amen. In Romans 8, it says, uh, sometimes it's quoted as creation, but the, actually the word is creature. It's a new species of being, never before seen. God in, God man, God in us. Never before seen, a whole new species of being. That's what we are. A new creature in this new kingdom. And this kingdom has laws, but they're different kind of laws. In this kingdom, we have the law of love. We're to love one another. We have the law of faith. We have the law of giving. We have the law of serving. These are the laws we are to live by, and there's more, and to grow in, and to be understood, and they are much easier than you think. You know why they're easier? Pardon? His burden is light? Yeah. You know why they're easier? The kingdom of God is, anybody know? From uh, Romans 14, I think. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's not a burdensome kingdom. It's righteousness. It's peace. It's joy in the Holy Spirit. 
Our gracious God has given himself by way of the Holy Spirit to abide in us and enable us with power. And Jesus has gone before and paved the way in his blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love to... Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this. And um, may we live anew in this new kingdom. May we not be like the Israelites that yearn for the past. You know, we just came through Passover season, and I, I was thinking about this. We came through Passover and it's all about the Israelites who were living under one kind of kingdom, weren't they? They were living in it. And it was hard work and it was toil. And God brings them out. And now there's a new way of living. And what do they do? They complain. They yearn to go back. It took him 40 years. <laughs> to let the old die out so the young that were raised up in this new way were strong enough to go in and capture and take over others. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to take any more time. I want to live in this new way and learn these new ways. The new way of living, he supplies. He's our giver. He takes care of things. We don't have to strive and toil. All glory to him. All glory to him. I thank you for the song you sang today. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did you have something, Nancy? Well, I was think I lost you for a little bit there, but I was thinking that the dis the display of light and darkness at the cross yes shows the stark contrast of darkness yes on the dark side there were lies mocking torture hate spitting killing stealing fighting destroying they were offended they were abandoned to the wolves. But the light was concern for people, forgiveness, love, not returning evil for evil, not retaliating, but just the truth, caring, freedom, drawing others to God, serving kind and gentle and in prayer. That was a big contrast of light. And when we receive the light, we are ambassadors for the light. So we cling to our shepherd because we're no longer abandoned like the, in the darkness, they're abandoned. But when we are under the shepherd's care, he takes care of everything. Amen. He sure does everything. And boy, there's a whole lot of preaching that we can do on that, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So we are so thankful, Father, for this time we have together and that we can encourage each other and, and every part brings something to the body. I am so thankful. I am thankful that when we gather together, Lord, the Holy Spirit in us, yes, praises God. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Father, I bless each one here in your name, Jesus. I bless them in the strength and the power of you, Holy Spirit, and the rejoicing and the freedom of the of freedom that you have given us in the love. May we love one another. May we be known by the way we love one another. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you all. We will um, maybe, uh, Josh, you up to, if we have commun communion now here, 
Will you be able to lead us? Okay. So let's gather around. We'll um, if if those of you on Go To Meeting have your elements ready, you can join us. If not, just join us with prayer too. I'll have um, Josh lead from up here, I think, so we can all hear. Okay. Love you all. be a good idea if we had music ready for something keyed up. That would be nice. Okay, ready? Yeah. Hello, everybody. I, I, we take this bread in remembrance of the body of our Savior. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Halom Hamotzi Lechem Min Aaretz. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ever existing, sovereign King of the universe, who brings forth the bread from the earth. Amen. Take this cup in remembrance of the covenant, the new covenant, the final covenant, giving us forgiveness of our sins and our everlasting life through the Messiah, Yeshua. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Bore Peri Hagafen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, sovereign King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing over the children now because I didn't do it, forgot to do it earlier. <laughs> so do we have the men with the tali and the kids? Nathaniel, would you like to join? Where do you want to do it? Back here, over here? Okay, we'll do over here. We have Nathaniel here with us today and Alandra. And oh my gosh, is she cute. We're going to have to show you how cute she looks too. Oh, look, they're both in green today. <laughs> here.
Come in. Yay. Oh, she looks so pretty. Oh, look at them. Yay, hi. So pretty.